This video has been a long time in the making. I've been gathering materials for it nearly since my channel started, and it's come to a point where I basically can't make a number of the videos on my list without doing this one first. The Greek soul concepts touch upon numerous other topics, ranging from the mind, to emotions, to various concepts of divine madness, to even the very theories around disease used by the Hippocratics and others. Needless to say, when I put the remaining topics up for a vote by patrons after the last video, they overwhelmingly went for the soul. As we're about to see, though, there wasn't just one Greek soul idea, nor, for a chunk of history, was the soul a singular thing, but rather multiple things that existed within a person. In other words, for a long time, the ancients believed every person had multiple souls, each of which served a different function in making that person who they were. So without further ado, let's get into it. Kaerete. This video took a lot out of me. I've barely scratched the surface, even with what I have, and even with the freedom of the long form, I'm still going to have to revisit several subtopics and perspectives on this in future videos. There isn't really a singular, quote, Greek idea of the soul, unquote. That's somewhat of a misnomer. The soul wasn't even a singular entity in the earliest Greek works, but rather consisted of multiple soul, quote unquote, organs in Homer, and we can assume earlier epics that have been lost. Plato and Aristotle disagreed with this view and proposed their own views on a singular, multi-component soul later, as did Plutarch, who tried to unify some of the later ideas into a coherent whole of a sort. As per usual, this video is divided into parts. The first part deals with Homer's concept of the Greek souls, yes, the plural is intentional, and how we get hints of it from the Iliad and the Odyssey. The second part focuses on Plato and his ideas around the tripartite soul, as displayed in three of his prominent dialogues. And the final part looks at Aristotle's work on the soul, which also gives us a glimpse at some other soul concepts that were contemporary to him at the time. I'm hoping that looking at all of these various concepts will help other Hellenists determine their own personal theologies around the solar souls, and that it will inspire you to do further research yourself. My sources will be cited in the description as always. Unless otherwise specified, the translations I'm using are the Leb translations of primary sources like Aristotle's On the Soul, or Tuft University's Perseus Library. Both provide the Greek and good footnotes and annotations on translation choices, so you can see the terminology being used directly if you can read Greek. I favor these translations heavily in general for this reason. I'm also going to focus on using the Greek terms, mispronounced or not, as much as possible through this video because there aren't good English equivalents for a lot of them. With that out of the way, let's get into Homer's souls. Part 1. Homer's souls. The beliefs around the Greek soul, or souls during the Archaic Age and prior, are complex and multiplicitous. The idea of a unified soul, according to Jan M. Bremer, is definitively a post-archaic idea. In Homer, the following soul concepts exist in various places, each functioning as either a part of a human organ or in place in the human body with the exception of the first. Psyche, or Suke, is the most common name for one of the parts of the Greek soul. This soul is best characterized as the, quote, free soul, unquote, often associated with the breath. According to Jan Bremer in The Early Greek Concept of the Soul, the word psyche is most likely related to psychane, or breath, and this makes a lot of sense. We see the word psyche referring to the mind in English, and it's from this Greek word that we get it. This is the so-called free soul that is also said to descend to Hades. Specifically, when somebody dies in Homer, it is said that the psyche or psyche was loosened, and that it flew down to Hades, implying that it did so under its own power. Hermes as psychopomp doesn't actually show up until Odyssey 24, which is widely agreed by scholars to be a later edition, and thereby not likely authored by Homer. So the the earliest ideas of the free soul involved with the afterlife specifically appear to see that part of the soul as going straight down all its own. This part of the soul is also said to wander about during out-of-body experiences and during dreams. Herodotus, noted father of lies, who claims this story dates back to the age of Homer, details the experiences of a man named Aristeas, whose tsuke was reputed to wander out of his body and upon the earth. They say Aristeas, a member of one of the noblest families of the city, entered 
entered a fuller's shop in Proconesus and dropped dead. The fuller closed his shop and left to inform the relatives of the dead man. When the story had already spread about the town that Aristeus was dead, an inhabitant of Sisius, who came from Aristeus, arrived and started to dispute those who said this, asserting that he had in fact just met Aristeus, who was on his way to Sisychus and spoken with him. Herodotus goes on to detail how the town went up to open the shop and found Aristeus gone, and Aristeus later returned to write a poem about his travels. He claimed he was possessed by Apollon and traveled north to learn of the Hyperboreans, the Greek Hyperboreans, not the Nazi dog whistle, and of the one-eyed Adamopsi who stole gold from griffins. 240 years later, Herodotus claims Aristeus appeared to the Metapontines to tell them to erect a statue of Apollon, first in his own form and later with Apollon in the shape of a raven. There are other examples of bilocation of the Suke in Apollonius's Mirabilia, referring to the story of Hermotimos, who was said to do similarly to Aristeus, but whose body was burned, sending his Suke finally to Hades while in one of these trances, as well as Pliny's natural history. Note that although these accounts are all said to take place during the age of Homer, those writing them date later in antiquity than the Archaic Age. Also, Herodotus, as useful as he can be, is also known to be absolutely full of it as often as not, which is fine, but remember to take his claims about the past with a, the collective tears of the Volcus who hate me, sized grain of salt. He often would record things that he heard completely verbatim, regardless of whether or not he thought they were true, though he did frequently make commentary on whether or not he believed certain things were true. So at the very least, he had integrity as historian. But in the modern day, a lot of what he did would actually probably be looked upon more as anthropology than history. Returning to the epics, the Psuke appears to be inactive when a person is awake, but can be lost in battle or leave the body during a swoon or unconscious episode. Seated in the head, losing their head and losing their psyche were synonymous in Homer. It's almost never mentioned in Homer aside from in reference to death, dreams, or out-of-body experiences in reference to the living. This gives the impression that the psyche wasn't thought about very much in the case of a living person, as the psyche seems to largely play a role in death and the afterlife unless a person is dreaming or bilocating somehow. In other words, if you're not knocked out or dying, the psyche doesn't do all that much. So when you have dreams about the gods, or generally, or if you've ever thought that you've experienced any kind of astral projection or world travel, that would be your psyche leaving your body as described by Homer. The same part of you that will ultimately enter Hades when you die, if that's what you believe. This brings us to the second soul organ, the thumos, associated with the chest and emotions, especially anger. Known perpetually angry hero boy Achilles, for example, in Book 20, Line 174 of the Iliad, was said to be driven by his rage and his thumos to face Aeneas. Later, in Book 22, Line 346, Achilles rages at Hector and tells him that by the wrath or menos, which we will talk about later, in his thumos, he compels him to rend his flesh from his bones due to the weight of the transgressions that Hector has committed against Achilles and his loved ones. When folks get angry, angry at social injustice in the world today, just know that that would be seen as a proxily functioning thumos in ancient times. And people say paganism isn't political. It is also seen as where the feelings of friendship, joy, or camaraderie spring. We're stronger together after all, and in Homeric times, the thumos would be what compelled us toward those feelings. In the Iliad 27, line 234, it is said that when Patroclus had been killed, the Trojans thumos strongly hoped to pull away from Patroclus's body from under Ajax. Hera was also said to feel glad in her thumos when she saw Poseidon on the battlefield putting courage into the heart of the Achaeans. Aeneas was said to be glad in his Thumos when he saw his men following behind him in Iliad 13, 494, and with joy comes fear, with numerous examples of this reference throughout the Iliad and the Odyssey. The first that comes to mind is when Nestor loses the reins of his horses and speaks fear in his Thumos to Diomedes of offering to Zeus in thanks for his victory. Later in Iliad 17, 625, Idomeneus is ordered to flee by Meriones because they believe that there is no hope of victory for the Achaeans. He is said to do so because fear had, quote, fallen upon his thumos. I plan on getting into how emotions seem to act as external forces to the self in Greek writing in a future video. 
The Thumos was also said to have a reasoning ability, but not quite the same kind as another soul organ we'll talk about in the moment, the Nous. Specifically, the Thumos is said to be involved in reasoning specifically in high stakes emotional situations. In Iliad 21403, Odysseus is left alone by the rest of the Greeks on the battle and speaks to his proud Thumos. Woe is me, what is to befall me? Great evil it were if I flee, seized with fear of the throng, yet this were a worse thing if I be taken all alone for the rest of the Danans hath the son of Kronos scattered in flight. But why doth my Thumos hold thus conversation with me? The last statement is closer to, why does my Thumos consider this in the first place, according to Bremer, because ultimately Odysseus knows that it's cowardly to run and not very pleasing to the gods. Talking to yourself must have been a lot more normalized back then. And I guess it would seem a lot more normal if you believe that there are a number of different soul organs that operate independently of you. The Thumos was also often referred to like a physical substance, as it was considered inactive during a swoon or unconsciousness and would have to be gathered back into the chest after such a time. In Iliad 22-475, Andromache fainted after seeing Hector's body dragged around the city. Quote, and when she had recovered her breath and the Thumos was concentrated into her friend. Bremer notes that the verb used in this line specifically means to gather and heavily implies that the Thumos is some kind of physical substance that scatters throughout the body when someone passes out. When Menelaus realizes that he hasn't been mortally wounded in Iliad 4, 152, Homer says that his thumos again became concentrated in his chest, implying that it can also scatter about the body when somebody believes that death is imminent. When someone does die, the thumos is said to leave the body, but not under its own power as the suke is said to do. When someone in Homer expresses the desire to kill someone, it's the thumos that is usually mentioned. The psuche is is only ever spoken of as being the soul that goes directly to Hades. So the Thumos clearly plays a major role as an animating force as well, but there's no real elaboration on what happens to it after someone dies. We get passages saying that it is blown out or flees the body, but it's never really connected with Hades or any other afterlife concept. It's just kind of gone when we die. Next, we have the Nous, or the Nos, the memory or knowledge base of a person or entity. In the Iliad 16.688, Homer tells us that regardless of what Patroclus may do, the Nos of Zeus is greater than that of men. Athena is admonished, did you not yourself design that Nous, and is referenced as cleverness when Nosica laid the lash on the donkeys with Nos. It's not always intellectual, though this meaning is predominant. Also located in the chest, but unlike the Thomos, does not appear to be associated with any physical substance that needs to be relocated. The Nos is most concerned with present facts and picturing them and differs from the Frenes in that the Frenes is concerned with reasoning about them. We'll talk about the Frenes later. Nos is where words like paranoia derives, which in ancient Greek effectively means a side memory or a stray mind. The Nos is never mentioned in Homer around death at all. Death is always described as the departure of the Thumos, the Psuche, or another part we'll discuss shortly, the Menos. Before the Menos, though, we do need to talk about the Frenes, which was also said to be located somewhere in the chest, sometimes in the Thumos. This is the logical or reasoning organ of the mind, examining what is within the Nos for accuracy. It's the seat of thought itself. In the fourth century BCE, Lycurgus quotes from an ancient poetic fragment for us that explains another concept in ancient Greek. Madness begins with a god taking away his man's nos that his frenes might not be able to reason correctly. When the anger of a daimon is to harm someone, it first does this. It takes away his good nos from his frenes and turns it to the worst opinion that the man may know nothing of the errors he commits. We see this in the Iliad when Agamemnon objects to Menelaus wanting to take a Rastos, prisoner in Iliad 661, and is said to convince the Frenes of his brother not to do so. In Iliad 10.4, Agamemnon is again referenced as debating many things in his Frenes. It makes sense, then, that if a deity or other entity wants to drive someone mad, they would take away the sole organ responsible for the knowledge base upon which the reasoning organ, or Frenes, could draw to make good decisions. It also has some associations with hunger and thirst, as was found in Iliad 11.89, when, while describing 
describing time, Homer talks about exhaustion upon the thumos of a woodman and his frenes being seized with a desire for food. Nearly every example I could find of the frenes and the thumos acting as organs of the soul and not just fren as a location in the chest, the two were seen together. They were clearly interrelated in Homer's mind, which makes a lot of sense. Neuroscientist Antonio Damasio demonstrated the link between decision-making and emotions in a groundbreaking study on people with brain damage in the areas associated with emotional processing. Consistently, these people were unable to make even the most basic decisions that would appear to have no emotional preference to the average person. The study specifies that their reasoning skills were fully intact, so it wasn't that they couldn't ponder a decision. Coming to a conclusion as an act seems to require emotions. The idea of a separate logic from emotions, that reason is somehow most pure when devoid of them, isn't even backed by science. I'm not saying Homer was a scientist or anything, it's just interesting how modern research parallels a few of these ideas. We are now at the menos, which is usually characterized as a momentary, overpowering impulse, often associated with battle rage and located either in the chest or in the thumos, though on occasion it could also be found in the frenes. A prominent example here would be Iliad 6101, when Helenos explains to Aeneas and Hector just how bad the situation caused by Diomedes is, as he raged furiously and no one can match him with his menos. Language around the menos and the gods often references flames and, quote, breathing into, unquote, the human from the gods, such as when Athena is said to breathe the menos into Diomedes in Iliad 10.482. Bremer associates this with breathing on a fire to get the flames to rise. Language around Hector's menos being indistinguishable supports this in Iliad 22.96, as does Meriones' statement that Aeneas had a difficult time, quote, putting out the menos of every man. Anyone who has ever tried to start a camping fire or a fire in a fireplace without kerosene or another quick igniting chemical knows all about blowing on flames to feed them. There's just enough oxygen moved toward the flames by your breath to get them to rise and grow. We also have the ion, which isn't clearly defined, but Bremer notes that it's only ever used in reference to young people and never the elderly. The ion is also said to depart when someone dies, but it does not go to the afterlife as the psuche does. Its absence appears to be the direct marker of death itself, unlike the psuche, which is said to depart and potentially wander during episodes of both sleep and by location, as noted earlier. You may also be familiar with the term idolon or idola. This is a word that means something close to ghost or shadow, and is only ever used in reference to the dead. According to Bremer, it's used to mark that the dead look just like their living counterparts, but are non-physical. If you try to embrace one, as Odysseus attempted to do with his mother, they flit away like shadows. This similarity was even said to come all the way down to the appearance of the wounds that happened just before death in warriors and the like, and that impression lasted all the way through the Roman Empire. I already did a video on whether or not the dead have minds in Homer and how complicated a question that is, link is in the iCard if you missed it, but it's interesting to note that Eidolon and Suke are almost always synonymous, but not always. Eidolon is always specifically used in reference to the appearance of a person after death when interacting with the living, whereas psuche is used in reference to the dead person free soul itself. Think about the difference between ghost or specter when you would use that in English versus the term soul, and you can hash out a rough equivalent. There are a few other minor soul organs called the Priapides that aren't mentioned very often through Homer, but appear to be specifically associated with the chest, heart, and very strong emotions. We don't see very much of them after Homer either, so I won't dig too deep into them here. Bremer doesn't either. From all of this, it becomes pretty clear that, one, in the Archaic Age, Greeks associated nearly all facets of human cognition and experience with various soul organs. Two, they didn't see the soul as a single unified thing, nor the person themselves, as we saw with the dialogues people had with their soul organs. Three, these soul organs could be hijacked by external forces toward nefarious ends. And four, only one of them appeared to be in any way related to the afterlife, though it was clear that all of them departed after death. This is the foundation upon which later authors like Plato, Aristotle, the Tragedians, Pindar, and Plutarch built their soul concepts, though I won't be covering all of them in this video. I found a number of references to various soul organs related to the mind and madness in other works by Ruth Paddle around the subject, but due to the breadth of those topics all on their own, I've decided that they're getting their own videos on madness, Greek's concepts of the mind, and Greek concepts around emotions, respectfully. With that in mind, we now come to the next major author that we'll see discussing souls in depth. Plato. Part 2. Plato. 
Plato talks about human souls and divine souls, including the All Soul in several of his works. The most prominent of these are the Republic, Timaeus, and Phaedrus. Keep in mind, everything we're about to discuss is a philosophical allegory, part of a dialogue that Plato crafted to help teach what he saw as philosophical truths to his students through the use of metaphor when plain language just wouldn't suffice. They're not meant to be taken literally, or as some absolute truth, but were instead presented to students and colleagues as objects of philosophical contemplation. Could've fooled some Platonists I've run into, but that's a topic that I've already done videos on. In Book 4 of His Republic, Plato asserts that the human soul has three parts. An appetitive part that generates desires such as those for food or pleasure, the seat of our emotions such as anger, and the part which reasons. The argument serves as part of the arguments for individual justice being made in this portion of the book on the whole, but remains relatively consistent with his other works on the topic, with a potential exception of a conflict we'll get to later in Phaedrus. But the matter begins to be difficult when you ask whether we do all these things with the same thing, or whether these are three things and we do one thing with one and another with another, learn with one part of ourselves, feel anger with another, and yet a third desire the pleasures of nutrition and generation and their kind, or whether it is with the entire soul that we function in each case when we once begin. This is what is really hard to determine properly. I think so too, he said. Then let us attempt to define the boundary and decide whether they are identical to with one another and in what way. How? It is very obvious that the same thing will never do or suffer opposites in the same respect in relation to the same thing at the same time. So if ever we find these contradictions in the functions of the mind, we shall know that it was not the same thing functioning, but a plurality. Very well. Yeah, have your audience insert simp for Socrates a little harder. Yes, Socrates, your brilliant Socrates, I bow before your intellect, Socrates. As a very minor side tangent, one of the annoyances I have with Plato's dialogues is that in a lot of them, the interlocutors for Socrates don't put up much of a fight. The dude talks, rainbows spew forth from his mouth, and all of philosophy is changed forever. I get that the dude was brilliant, but as an author, I can see why Plato hated writers so much. They're better at actual realistic dialogue than he'll ever be. I'm not saying his composition is bad. I'm saying and he should have chose his genre more well suited to his writing style because dialect to gain it, and I'm well aware of the fact that a lot of people say he basically invented it. It doesn't mean he actually does it well. Tangent aside, he goes on to argue the existence of hunger, thirst, etc. must be a faculty of the soul, because despite feeling thirst or hunger, sometimes humans will refuse to eat or drink what is available on the grounds of quality or for other reasons. This he calls the epithumia, which I'll note has a negative connotation with things like lust or excess. Similarly, there's a part of the soul which longs for knowledge, truth, and reason, which he describes as mastering the appetitive or hungry part of the soul. This he refers to by a term we've seen before. Before, nos, which to Plato has taken on the characteristics of both the Homeric nos and the Homeric frenes, as well as the Homeric suke. The third, which he uses the term thumos that we heard earlier for, specifically refers to a seat of righteous anger when one is wronged, which Plato argues is necessary for individual justice. This is also the seat for the soul's desire for honor and recognition for society as a whole. He makes further arguments about how the parts of the soul seem more prominently developed in certain classes in the society of his day, as well as the theoretical society that he proposes in the Republic. The appetitive is the part of the soul that most corresponds to the working and merchant class, the thomos is most prominent among the helpers or auxiliary workers, and reason is most common among the ruling class in his theoretical society. Another minor side tangent, yeah Plato, having a bunch of philosophers get into a giant orgy and produce a ruling class that will be forever, the hereditary rulers of society would work out amazingly. We've never had the idea of a divan mandate of kings turn out badly in history. Nope, not at all. Anyway, later in book 10, he basically shit talks the idea of art as a concept through Socrates, claiming that art can only imitate the specifics of situation without reflecting universal truths. As an author, this is a major issue I have with Plato for the record. Glaucon asks Socrates if death destroys the soul or if the soul lives on after death. And Socrates argues that death itself is not something that can make someone individually unjust. So it's not possible that it can destroy the soul. We then get into the myth of Air, a soldier who comes back to life on a funerary pyre and tells of his experiences of the afterlife. I'll go over some of Plato's ideas around the afterlife in a future video, but too long didn't read is that they are two places that a soul can go. Up to be joyous for a thousand years or down to have the corruption of your soul burned away for a thousand years. After the time is up, humans see the fates, drink a cup of forgetfulness and choose a new life. This brings us to Timaeus, which expands the cosmology of Plato and gives us an idea of where he thought these parts of the soul came from. He describes a world soul created by the Demiurge or unmoved mover, which he believes 
believes created all things, in order to bring order to a chaotic universe. The word soul is described as a reality resembling a series of overlapping circles and serves as an intermediary between the forms, which Plato thought were the perfect original ideas from which all physical things were mere models, and imperfect physical reality. Aristotle had a lot of fun dunking on the idea of the forums in Nicomachean Ethics, which you can find out more about on my stream on Nicomachean Ethics Book 1, link in the iCard. You could drown in Plato's descriptions of the world soul and how it serves as the seat of movement for all planetary bodies, but that's not really what we're here for, because our concerns regard the souls of individual humans. Plato explains our souls as containing one indestructible component from the Demiurge mixed in the same mixing bowl he used for making the world soul. The souls of the gods are affixed to supposedly indestructible things, the stars and the world soul respectively, because he doesn't want to have to undo the work he did making them. As a result, the stuff that he uses to make up the soul of mortals are said to be slightly less pure than the souls of the gods at this point. He attaches all of these souls also to the stars and apparently makes as many of these souls as there are stars, then hands off the souls to the gods to then mix physical and mortal things with them to create life. The divine part of the soul is then attached to the mortal experiences of desire, sensation, and the aforementioned thumos, which here also stands in for fear as well as anger. These two must be mastered by the immortal reasoning part of the soul, or the nos, according to Plato, for humans to live just lives. When desire and rage slash fear overwhelms reason, human lives unjustly, but when reason predominates, we live justly. There are a lot of problems with these ideas, mind you, but this explains why the soul was divided so in Plato's view point. Coming back to the myth of air from earlier, the reason forgetfulness is required is because mortality necessitates both epithymia, or desires, and physical needs, including both getting it on and nourishing yourself. And thumos, because self-defense and self-protection is essential to continuing to live life as a mortal. Because the nos is the immortal part of the soul, the reason, as it were, its activity in the world is largely concerned with governing these two drives in physical existence. Freed of the body, it can still think about things, but has has no reason to think about or remember the specifics regarding the other two drives as the body is no longer there to necessitate them. All that's left is to process the lessons of that life, not the specifics, in either of the heavens or in Tartarus. He makes the argument that the souls of other animals also possess the nos, but simply don't make as much use of it as humans, and that there's nothing stopping them from becoming humans if they choose so in future lives. He argues that the souls of plants are completely different and not interchangeable as the souls of animals are, but we're not going to get too deep into that. It's simply important to note. In Phaedrus, which is largely an argument about the role of love in relationships, Plato makes the argument that the soul must be ungenerated and immortal, as nothing else exists which moves itself through its own power. All things that move must contain a soul. He makes the claim, through Socrates, that human souls once had wings and could rise to follow the trains of the gods, but became corrupted through competition and fell to earth. Contemplation of the perfect beauty of the forms and or gods causes these wings to regrow on the soul, which needs philosophical contemplation contemplation in order to once again rise to be close to the gods. Plato again divides the soul into three parts, this time using the analogy of two horses and a charioteer. The charioteer is the nous, or divine part of the soul, reason, though this time he doesn't liken it to the demiurge. The two souls are the thumos, here specifically referred to as a friend of honor, joined with temperance and modesty and a follower of glory, and the epithymia, which he describes as the friend of insolence and pride, shaggy ear and death, hardly obedient to whip and spurs. Plato claims that when the souls of philosophers contemplate potential past life memories or glimpses of the gods and or forms, they are inspired to beauty themselves by their nos and thereby cow the left horse of desires into submission. This horse can never be properly trained to love that which is good, only terrified into obedience. It will always remain evil. This is where a lot of the Platonist ideas surrounding the body itself being evil originate. The more human souls give in to their desires and passions, as it were, the more corrupted this part of them becomes and the more there is to burn off in the afterlife. There are additional details regarding cycles of rebirth and how long they last based on what the souls gets up to during these life cycles, but I'll cover those more into a future video if I ever get around to it. So yeah, a lot of the Christian ideas of the fall of humanity actually came from corrupting the heck out of Plato, or at least the writers that came up with the apocryphal sources for a lot of them did. I've got a video down the line planned on the histories of the Christian heaven and hell, as well as the Platonic and later Neoplatonic ideas around the afterlife. There are just quite a few videos to go through before those will get done. There are a lot of discussions around the ideas of elements and such that I left out here, and I highly recommend digging through the source material if you're interested in those aspects. Plato's most famous student, Aristotle, actually went after some of those ideas in his own work on the soul. 
Part 3. Aristotle. The Dunk King in a Shade himself, Aristotle wrote what could be considered one of the most detailed works we have on the classical era views of the nature of souls, reflecting a number of earlier theories in the beginning parts of the work. I highly recommend checking out the Leb translation if you'd like to get deeper into that. It's a very interesting read, and at times it feels as though it gets a bit granular, such as the nature of philosophy after all. From Aristotle's On the Soul Book 1, we get a peek at some of the other post-Homeric soul concepts floating around in ancient Greece, mostly to debunk them and masquerade the egos of their progenitors, but we still get a look at them nonetheless. He starts off with the statement that looking into the soul is essential to all knowledge, because it is the first principle of all living things. So understanding the soul will let us understand all of nature and truth. It is also one of the most difficult undertakings a philosopher could possibly undergo, because separating the role of the soul from the functions of the body is damn near impossible. I can hear the cheers of the anti-theists in the crowd now. Hold your horses, folks. Make Plato proud. With that, he talks about the older idea that the soul must be associated with motion and feeling, and that it must also confer motion unto the body, because when the body is dead, the soul departs and it can't move anymore. But the soul can't have full autonomy over all motion, otherwise it would be able to re-enter a dead body and no one would die. The soul also needs to be associated with breathing, because breathing is the single feature of all life that indicates life is still present in the body. Democritus, Aristotle says, sees the soul as being composed of the element of fire and heat, because fire moves itself independently and strives upward, as Plato says the soul does. Democritus also associates the atoms that are spherical with fire and also with the motes of dust in the air, which you might see in the sunbeams coming through your window. He says these particles in some compose all of nature. Lucipus, he says, adopts a similar position because those spherical shapes of atoms can most readily move fast and through anything and can move other things because they move, which is what the soul is said to do. Apparently, the Pythagoreans thought something similar as well. Anaxic Gorus was said to relate the soul instead to the mind and believe that the mind set everything in motion. He notes that Anaxagoras believes that truth is subjective and relates Homer's description of Hector in swooning as lying thinking other thoughts, which led him to the conclusion that the soul and mind are one. He then goes on to toss shade about how careless Anaxagoras is in his association, for he refers to the mind as responsible for what is right and correct, but in other instances the soul is the source, and seems to separate the idea of mind from the idea of intelligence. He states that intelligence is not to be found in all beasts or even men, but that the mind is. He makes reference to a number of other thinkers and boils down all of their conclusions to three characteristics of the soul, movement, sensation, and incorporeality. While noting that everyone who thinks the soul is also connected to intelligence also thought the soul is made of a single or several elemental particles of some kind, and none of them thought that it was made of earth, which he thought was interesting. With that, he begins to break down these ideas, stating the soul cannot be fully responsible for movement because it doesn't have a set place in the body, so it cannot physically move it. He also comes to the conclusion that the mind must be implanted in the soul and indestructible, and that the degradation seen from age, illness, affliction, and madness is not actually a degradation of the mind, Mind, but of the body, which he calls the vehicle of the mind. The soul also cannot be made of elements, because the majority of the stuff made out of elements does not contain a soul. It's gotta be made out of something else. So what is the soul then? Well, with all of his predecessors well and truly roasted, we move on to book two, where Aristotle tells us that we're going to start fresh with him to try to determine the nature of the soul. We start with bodies, because the soul is the, quote, first actuality of a body possessing life. So we need to figure out what the difference between a body that is alive and one that is dead is. Living bodies require sustenance to continue living, which is why plants are said to be alive even though they have no other capacity associated with the soul. Because plants can be subdivided and animals cannot, and because Aristotle associates the soul as giving life to the being that lives, he postulates that plants may in fact have many souls, whereas animals have only one. The soul has to be a substance within the body giving it the quality of life. Soul plus body equals an animal or person. He also talks about how other qualities associated with life, such as sensation and cognition, and how all animals appear to possess some degree degree of these things, with men having the highest degree of both. So long as an animal is alive and can move about their habitat seeking food and filling their needs, that animal will continue to consume what is needed to preserve the life of their body. He notes the need for nourishment corresponds with the desire, inclination, and wish because hunger and thirst are desires and animals have the sense of touch as well as all of these things. The rarest of these qualities, he states, is reason, because one must possess sensation, movement, and desire to also have reason. If any of those are missing in a species, it cannot reason, he claims. If a species lacks one of these qualities, that species must also lack the part of the soul that aligns with that quality. So plants lack reason, sensation, and motion. Some animals like bivalves lack motion and reason, but not sensation or desire, etc. 
He spends most of the rest of book two into book three describing how he thinks the various senses work, and I won't bore you by getting too deep into it. I highly recommend checking out the Leb translation if you'd like to dig into how his mind works and how he thinks sensations come to be in living things. It's really interesting if you're into it, but it would take a really long time to thoroughly dive into here. Because of this, the first faculty of the soul must be desires, he decides. The second sensation, which he defines as the power of receiving unto itself the sensible forms of things. The third, cognition or sentience, which he divides from sensation by stating the proved processes cannot be identical because sensation is found among all animals, but thought clearly isn't. Sentience is what allows a being to determine what is virtuous and or correct or true and what is not. He then defines the mind as whatever is capable of being thought and states that it doesn't exist until thoughts come into being. Like this script existing in my head, but not really until I actually sat down to write all 13 pages of the dang thing. He goes off on a tangent about knowledge only being knowledge if the understanding of something actually matches the reality of the thing and that the mind is also where knowledge is stored. It is impossible to learn anything ever without sensation, even if those senses are being used to perceive other tools that extend the senses beyond what they're capable of on their own. Finally, he distinguishes the mind from imagination, which he claims is found in all animals and is either used to figure out how to fill a desire or corresponds to the senses that created the desire in the first place. Only some animals have the portion that can reason through and plan for the future, but all animals have some level of the portion that responds to desire itself. So in sum, all living creatures, plant or animal, have a soul while they're alive. The more complicated and capable the creature, the more well-developed the various parts of the soul are, or the more soul parts that they contain. The soul is what pushes the being from birth to death and eventual decay. I wonder what Aristotle would have thought about the soul if he had access to our modern scientific understanding of things like animal intelligence and cognition, as well as the breakthroughs that we've had in identifying where a lot of these sensory processes originate. For one thing, we now know that there's a lot more than the five senses he identified in the dialogue, and that animals have senses that expand far beyond our perceptions into areas that we could only dream of. Look up videos of theoreticals on how bees see flower, for example, and you will see what I mean. At this point though, it's clear that Plato and Aristotle had a massive impact on the ancient Greek perceptions of the soul, both arguing for a unity and a simplification that is just not present in earlier conceptions of it. You can can see both their influences in Christianity as well, and in many of the later arguments about what the soul could be in modern day theistic circles. So there you have it. I'm sure a few of you are wondering what I think after all that historical deep diving, and the answer is complicated. On the one hand, I do believe that we have souls that go somewhere after death, and that somewhere is likely the Homeric Hades, as I outlined in my video on the topic. On the other hand, a lot of theories about the soul came from a lack of access to scientific knowledge in ancient times, as well as a lack of access to the tools needed to even investigate such things. In Aristotle, we see some early signs of the scientific method, especially in his methodical treatment of the senses and desires for precision in the definition of everything he discusses. I think he'd be a biologist if he were born today. I think I think that the conflation of the suke and noose that we see with him, paired with the Homeric afterlife and the Homeric ideas around the different parts of the self as individual narrators, is likely close to the truth. I talked about the narrator's issue in my video on latent Christianity, link in the i-card if you want to know more. The idea of a singular unified self is challenged more and more in psychology every day, and these concepts of various soul organs in dialogue line up best with the predominant theories in the present day about how the self comes to be. Remember that these definitions rely a lot on cultural context as well as knowledge. Our views in the modern day of what disorder of the mind look like are very different than in ancient times. Our knowledge of animal cognition and even communication between plants, insects, and fungal species puts a lot of ancient thought into a very different light. It's very important to think through what was said in the past as well as what we know now when you try to answer these questions for yourself. Regardless, I hope that this satisfies your curiosity on how the soul evolved in Greek thought in ancient times. I may revisit the topic sometime in the future to cover some later thinking years like Plutarch and Pindar, or to look into the concepts like the world soul of Plato or the universe as the mind of Zeus from the Stoics. Dualism in ancient Greece wasn't nearly as clear cut as it seemed on the surface. This is why looking into the original languages is so key when studying myth to learn about ideas in ancient cultures. I covered that in an older video, link is in the iCard if you're interested. Regardless, I can't wait to hear from you all on what you think, because holy crap, I read so much for this video. It was a ton of fun to research, but I went through a massive amount of material in a very short time and still barely feel like I scratched the surface myself. I highly, highly recommend looking into these things on your own and reading as many of these sources as you can find, including some of the less expensive scholarly works on the topic to help you determine your own theologies.
With that out of the way, thank you so much for sticking through that. If you're new here, breathe into the subscribe button, a menos fit to send the likes suke to Hades. Drop down into the comments and let me know what was most interesting to you, or which of the topics I hinted at in the intro or throughout the video you'd be most interested in seeing next. Getting this video done opened the door for a lot of fascinating topics on the philosophical side of Hellenism. And I can actually do the Snakes in the Dead video now too. Special thanks also to my patrons. You all voted on this back when I released my video on divination ethics, and I'm kinda glad you did. I've been putting off this one for a while due to the sheer magnitude of the topic, and your vote finally pushed me to get it out of the way so I could move on to other fun stuff, like madness and the mind. Thank you all so much for your support in the transition to deeper dives on topics like this that really need it. May the cycle of reciprocity between us ever remain positive. And remember, we're stronger together.